Yes. Okay. Uh, Rodrigo, start with your uh, cover slide. Great. We're recording now. Rodrigo is going to give us the perspective of what we've covered so far. Take it away, Rodrigo. Well, um, the topic is Python. And the problem is that as they develop, robots are taking over people's jobs. And our mission is to become a Python expert and learn how to build um, good games to make people's life better. Great. The programming primitives, mm -hmm. programming um, are these. Okay. Here I have kind of a timeline that uh, I that you showed us last class. Okay. And here I compare. Okay. Can you uh, read uh, the slide four just to? Um... Yeah. Um, yes. Um, the first language was machine language. It was um, like. It is the way peop, uh, computers think Great. Uh, with binary. Good. Zero and ones. I like the way you you put it in your own words. That's a sign you really uh, have a good grasp of the history and the and the material. And then Fortran came along in 1954. Um, it was like the first. Uh, uh, language uh, with English-like comments. Then came BASIC in 1964. That was um, simpler and designed for people who are not into this world of programming. And um, I have, I'm not sure about how to spell this. C and C++. Well, C and C++. In 1972, it is like improving. <laughs> uh, well, then, yeah. lower level language, which means you're talking closer to the computer and less like English. Yes. So it tends to be a more efficient language. Uh, Jang and, and uh, Matthew, please chime in if you can add any perspective to this. Go on, Rodrigo. Okay. And yeah, that, um, well, it is like more, um, how to say it, more compatible. Uh, it has more uses, but it is less efficient. Okay. Then Python that enables a programmer to think like a human, which also enables more people to being able to program. Great. Then JavaScript that was very important because as it was developed for the internet, yeah. it is like um, to enhance the the internet, yeah. you can make a better website with it. Mm -hmm. And finally, Scratch in 2003. And that is totally different. It is very, very easy to use and learn. And you don't need to be writing things. Great, great. You only have blocks. You that and everyone is like capable of using. Great, okay. And slide five. Um, here I compared Scratch and Python. Wow. Um, um, Scratch is very simple. And in, the, in Scratch, there are sprites, so you can create uh, video games uh, in the Scratch um, 
language. And, but in Python, you can also build games, but it is like more versatile and has many uses. Even it could, you could build the entire Scratch program in Python. Hmm. Both have the benefit of that many people use them. So it is very easy to troubleshoot and to learn new things in that languages. Okay. All right. Good. I can tell you've done some research. All right, Rodrigo. <laughs> Any comments, Ng or Matthew? Um, uh, yeah, so I really admire your passion in learning the language. Yeah, I think uh, as a programmer, so everyone has some ambitions in changing the world. Since uh, our Python or programming could develop, the, uh, improve the efficiency for a lot of works. And also, uh, I really like your slides for, since you told us a lot of history that I even don't know. Yeah, I think that's very interesting in making the comparison of the different languages and also list the timeline for different languages. So I think, uh, yeah, you did a very good work. work. Great. Yeah, I definitely agree with Jane here. Like your, your work here is very thorough. You cover a lot of stuff, which is really cool. So yeah, you definitely did your research, which is awesome. I think the one thing I would add is on your history of programming slide, there's one language, I don't know if we covered this last week, but I think adding HTML somewhere in there could be valuable because that's also another really important one. Yeah. You know, what we should do is put HTML and JavaScript together, you think? Mm -hmm. Or maybe HTML should, HTML really came along first and then JavaScript. Right, right. Okay. Um, yeah, that's a great suggestion. HTML may, really made the web pop, popular. It was so, it's so easy to make a screen display with HTML. And before you knew it, everyone was doing it. Um, sure. Great, great. Yeah, otherwise, the, these slides are really well done. They look great. So, yeah. good job. Good. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, Matthew has prepared an interesting uh, comic book for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I guess we can just jump right into that. Or do we want to go over like presenting ideas or something? So uh, no, let's just dive straight into it. Um, this is a comic uh, Python. In, in a comic book. Yeah. Hi, Paulina. Hi, Donovan. Welcome. Glad you could join. All right. So, yeah, today we're going to talk about data types in Python. And data types are sort of a fundamental concept in any programming language that you'll learn. And you'll see why in a little bit. So, for starters, can anyone tell me what apple times orange is? <laughs> That's a trick question, guys. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a little bit of a trick question, right? And so are all the rest of these. So 3.5 blended with 17, that doesn't really make any sense. True plus banana doesn't make any sense, right? So can anyone tell me why these don't make sense? Like, why can't we do apple times orange? Rodrigo, you're the mathematician. <laughs> well, you don't have like context. You don't right. know the value of them. Yeah, exactly. Like the operation, which is multiplication, doesn't really work with, you know, fruits like apples and oranges like you can't multiply fruits you can multiply numbers though and i guess in a similar way like blended with like you could blend apples and oranges and make a weird fruit juice but you can't really do that with numbers so this is kind of why we need data types and also 
a little bit more. So in the very last one, strawberry minus three. The problem there is that we can't really mix like different types of things in this case. So like we have a fruit and a number, and if we try to do something with those, it gets a little bit confusing. So yeah, this is why we need data types. In Python, there are three different kinds of data types that we'll talk about. So there's booleans, there's text, and there's numbers. So I'm sure you guys can maybe sort of figure out what text and numbers are. Does anyone know what a Boolean is? Those of you who have done Minecraft 102 or 103, do you remember we talked about Boolean algebra? Yes. Go ahead, Rodrigo. Um, it is like binary. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's basically binary. Uh, or in Python, it's mostly described as true or false. So it's a little bit of a weird name. The concept is relatively simple, though. We're just working with trues and falses. And in Python, the whole name Boolean is just shortened to bool, so B-O-O-L. Boolean, by the way, correct me if I'm wrong if you know better than I do, was a mathematician in England, I think. And um, he, he developed the whole math uh, behind Boolean algebra. And he, I think he didn't even graduate from college. Uh, and so no one took him seriously. But his math is the fundamental math for computer science. Mm -hmm. So he really changed the world. Is that, do I have that correct, Matthew? I am actually not 100% sure on that. Okay. okay. Uh, I'm going to look that up while you keep going. Okay. Sounds I want to get that information. All right. So, yeah, Booleans, they're really simple, but it's also, they, they are extremely useful as well. And we'll go through a couple of the uses in a little bit. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna pull up a Python console. Does, does anyone, does everyone have Python downloaded? Or is that, has that happened yet? Is everyone, everyone loaded uh, all Python? Malina, uh, Paulina? Let's go around the horn. Um, Rodrigo, have you loaded Python? No. Yeah. OK, I guess um, you're going to have to. Uh, Donovan, have you loaded Python? I don't hear um, we really covered that. Right. Yeah. OK, so we can go through how to do that really quickly. Yeah. So I'm just going to open up a Google Chrome tab here. Any browser works, just uh, Google Python. You'll have welcome to python.org. Click that. All right. And then there will be a link to download if you scroll down a little bit. So you click there. Okay. This is excessive. There might be an easier way to do this. Actually, if you highlight over downloads, then there should be a button here that you can click on, then it'll download a file. Uh, one and, thing maybe I need to add. Okay. So uh, before you're downloading Python, uh, make sure your computer is for Mac system or Windows system. And also your computer is 32 bit or 64 bit. Yeah. So that will uh, influence uh, your version of Python. Yeah. Yeah. Most of you probably have 64 bits. Right. Okay. So if you're not sure, uh, you, uh, if you have a relatively new computer, it's yeah, I think uh, a lot of most of the computer is for 64, but uh, Mac maybe 
with a different version of Windows Python. Yeah, so make, make sure that you download the Python for Mac or for Windows. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's rarely used 32 right now. Indeed. All right. So once you have that downloaded, you can just click on the link. I already have it downloaded, so my screen's going to look slightly different. But once you have it downloaded, you should have a folder of stuff. You'll have idle, Python 3.8, the manuals, and module docs. So what we're going to use is we're going to use idle. This is sort of like a console that we can type in things and make Python code, essentially. So once you have it downloaded, you should have idle. And if you click there, Oh wait, I'm only sharing, my bad. All right, yeah, so this is what idle looks like. It's just gonna be a big white screen with text on it. Relatively boring, but we're gonna type a lot of stuff on it and make it exciting. All right. Let me organize my screen a little bit here. Okay, there we go. So uh, we're gonna do some stuff with Booleans. Don't, don't worry if you don't have it downloaded yet. Uh, you can just follow along and watch what I'm doing here and then try this out yourself later. So uh, we have two Booleans in Python. We have true and false. So here, if I type true with a capital T, you can see it turns orange. So that means the Python console recognizes it as like Boolean. Now you have to be really careful here, because if you don't capitalize true, it doesn't turn orange. So it's not recognizing it properly as the Boolean. The capital letter it does, and with lowercase, it does not. All right. So does anyone know what kind of like operations we can do on booleans? So like how do we how do we combine booleans together? We can't really do true plus true, but there's something sort of similar we can do. And again, if you've taken Minecraft 102 or 103, you should maybe recognize this. We called them gates in those classes. Remember we did two kinds of gates? If you put two inputs into a gate, you get an output and an or. Yeah, so two of the most important operations for Booleans are AND and OR. So the way AND works is the output is true only if the two inputs are both true. So if I type true AND true, you can see the AND also turned orange. I hit enter, the output is here in blue, and it's true. If I do any other combinations like true AND false, or false and false, the output is gonna be false. So the output is only true if both of, if the first input and the second input are true. An OR gate works slightly differently. Uh, the output is true if the first input or the second input are true. So if I do true or false, I'll output true. False or true will also do true. True or true, output's true. So in this case, the output is only false if both of the inputs are false. So false or false gives us false. Okay. And there's actually one other operation. It's less of a, you, you don't use it to combine Booleans, but what it does is it reverses them. So if I type not true, 
and left foot false. And not false is true. So the three operations are and, or, and not. So you can do all kinds of things with these. You can even chain these together. So if you want to do true and true, you can use parentheses to throw in maybe an extra and. Yeah, you can make really complex, you know, algebra expressions with these booleans. Yeah, does that make sense? Is everyone following along? Okay. This is great. This is great, Matthew. All right. Yeah, I uh, add a bit of historical perspective here. So uh, George Boole, uh, who lived in England about 100 years ago, uh, discovered or invented uh, or conceived of Boolean algebra. And um, he didn't even go to college. Uh, he just learned math on his own by reading books, by reading Newton's journals, um, and no university would take him seriously because they, you know, they thought anyone that doesn't go to school couldn't possibly be a, a good mathematician. Um, but it turns out Boolean algebra was so revolutionary that he ultimately got an appointment to Cambridge University, which is I mean, like the, one of the most prestigious colleges in the, in the, on the planet. And he won um, one of math, math's highest awards for Boolean algebra. So um, uh, it shows you don't, you don't need to go to school to learn important things <laughs> if you have a passion to learn on your own. Sorry, Sorry to interrupt, uh, Matthew. Just wanted yeah, to. It's, yeah. it's definitely cool to have the historical context of these things. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I do want to go over one of the other uses for Booleans because this all kind of seems weird. You know, why would you want to combine trues and trues? So I'm going to talk about the equals operator. So if I wanted to write like a math expression, right? And let's, let's say I write two plus three equals five. And in Python, it's very important. Your equals signs need to be doubled. So you need to have a double equal sign. So if I hit enter here, the output is actually true. So what this is saying is that two plus three equals five is a true expression. Now, if I type two plus two equals five, and I hit enter, the output is false. So it reads that as a false expression. So this could be useful. Uh, you can use this to maybe like check really long homeworks. So like, let's say all of your problems in your homework, you know, you had one plus four, you went to five, and two plus eight equals 10, and three plus four equals seven. And then the output is true because you got all of these answers right. But if you happen to miss exactly one of them, like maybe you messed up and you said two plus eight equals nine, when the output is false, because one of these is incorrect. So this is sort of one possible application for Booleans that you might use in your programming. And it'll also be important in like if statements and things, but we'll get there, we'll get there. <laughs> all right, so I think that's all I wanna cover with Booleans. Does anyone have any questions on these? Or does this make sense? Looking good. Anyone wanna summarize what are the three data types? Go ahead, um, Sophia. They were, uh numbers yep um letters letters uh, text yeah and blue booleans <laughs> that's a hard one to say <laughs> booleans logic ones and zeros twos and falses great very good <laughs>
All right, cool. So the next thing I want to go over is text. So text or letters. In Python, we call these strings, which is usually shortened to str. So strings are actually super useful. Uh, in Python, the way we denote a string is we're going to wrap it in quotation marks. So if I wanted to write like apple as a string, I would do a quotation mark, apple, and then another quotation mark. So you can see that the text actually turns green once we use a quotation mark. Then anything we do outside of it will be black. Yeah. So yeah, if I answer here, the output will be apple as a string. All right, so for strings, there are not that many operations we can do with them. We can add strings, actually, weirdly enough. So if I wanted to do apple plus orange, the output of this, you might not expect this, is apple orange. So all it does is, if you're adding two strings, just sort of shoves them together. Yeah, and if you wanted a space in between apple and orange, what you could do is you could do apple plus space plus orange. And then this space string here would just be in between the apple and the orange. So the output would be apple space orange. All right, so Outside of that, though, there aren't that many operations we can do on strings. You can't really subtract strings. Like if I tried to do like apple minus a, you throw an error. So anything that shows up in red is an error, and it means you did something wrong. And it's important to be able to like read through these and sort of figure out what's happening, since there's a lot of words here, right? Basically, all it's telling us is that we tried to do apple minus a in this line here. And then it's throwing a type error. And what that means is our data types were a little bit weird. It says unsupported operand types for minus string and string. So that means we tried to do minus on string and string. And that's unsupported, or it's just not allowed. Like we can't subtract strings. Yeah, so being able to figure out what your errors are saying is going to be super helpful in the future, just because when you're debugging your code, I guess it's important to know. Whenever you're writing code, most of the time, it's never going to be correct, like the first time you run it. Like that's super rare, rarely ever happens. And I'm sure Jang can speak to this. But yeah, it's almost never happens. So half of coding is debugging, which basically just going through your code and fixing things that you messed up the first time. And you're going to have to be looking at these errors a lot and figuring out what's wrong. Yeah, so this here is a type error. Just means our types were a little bit wrong here. All right, so yeah, the only thing we can really do with strings is add them. There's not much else we can do. We can try multiplying times a, another type error. Can't multiply sequence by non-ints of type string. Hmm. Well, actually, that gives me an idea. So we can actually multiply strings by numbers. And in this case, we did apple times two. That just gave us two apples. So it's apple apple. Yeah, so that's sort of a fringe use. You're probably not going to be doing that too much. All right. Cool. And there is one other. All right. This is, I guess, our first function that we're going to be using. So if I wanted to find the length of a string, so all I have to do is I type len. And it's a little hard to see, but it actually, it's sort of purple. It turned purple when I typed the end. So that means it recognizes it as a function. So then I put a parenthesis, I type apple, 
in quotation marks because it's a string. Always remember that. And then a close parenthesis. What do you guys think the output is going to be here when I hit enter? It's supposed to tell me the length of the apple. So how long is this string? How many characters does it have? Come on, guys. Come on, guys. Five. Five, all right, Sophia. Very good, Sophia. So when I hit enter, it tells us five. So yeah, this is actually super useful. Uh, you'll definitely find applications for this later. All right, so the last concept we're gonna go over for strings, it's a little bit on the weirder side, and it's called indexing. You probably haven't heard of this outside of like a coding context. But essentially what indexing is for is if you have a string and you wanna like figure out a specific character of the string. So like, let's say I wanted to figure out the first letter of the word orange. So what I would do is, actually it's on the right here. So I type orange, which is our string, and then we use the brackets, which on your keyboard should be like close to the upper right. So you do open bracket, zero, close bracket. So the weird thing about indexing is the first character is zero. Second character is one, the third character is two, fourth character is three, fifth character is four, et cetera, et cetera. It goes on to infinity. So this is known as zero indexing. It just means the very first character in a string is zero. So yeah, we can see in this example here, we're using indexing by using our brackets. So orange two will actually find the third letter of the word orange. So the output is A, this third letter. Orange zero is the first letter, which is O. There's also a weird thing we can do with negative numbers as the indexes. So like, let's say I wanted to find the second to last letter of orange. The way we do that is just by using negative indexes. So the second to last letter would be minus two to Z. And if I wanted to find the last letter of a word, I would use minus one. So the last letter of orange is E. All right, does this make sense so far? I can replace orange with any other word and it would work just the exact same way. All right, so. Yep. Matthew, can you give some examples of how uh, you uh, use this? Uh, yeah, for sure. So. In a, right in a game or Jeng, uh, in your game, in your game code, can you uh, tell some examples of how you'd want to um, identify a particular letter? What are practical applications? Oh, your microphone is muted. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, I think, uh, yeah, so for the data type and for arrays, that's a very important concept. Since, uh, for example, uh, we need to, so yeah, so Matthew, can you go through your PowerPoint for the orange example? Yeah, so the oh, PowerPoint, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so you can see that uh, there are a lot of different, uh, oh, oops, sorry, can I use annot annotate something? Okay. Uh, yeah, is there a okay. way I can you? Yeah, can you see that? Yeah. Yeah, oh, oops. Yeah, there you go. Okay, thank you. Okay, I can do that. Yeah, so you can see that, uh, uh, so that's a very important concept. So you can see uh, our array could not only be a character or a word, that can also be some very complex data type. So for example, you can not only store O in the first index, you can also uh, store something else like the character 
maybe the one or two or three or uh, for each of the uh, position you can also store uh, the true or false the another data type so yeah so you can see that uh, the array is a very important uh, uh, practice for example in the in our ants game that I showed you last week so there are a lot of blocks so they have the very same theory so with the array yeah so array is a very important and uh, nice concept and uh, Matthew emphasizes uh, some yeah so this index for calling the different position for array so that's very important uh, yeah we can use it later yeah yeah so the concept of indexing will come into account for arrays, which we'll talk about. I think next week we're going to go over data structures. Oh, OK. Yeah, okay. yeah. Perfect. So for text specifically, like, let's say I had, hmm, like, if I had maybe like a list of objects in a game. So like maybe there's like a car, there's the player, and there's can even put commas in between these. And there's, what else would there be? Like there's a background, et cetera. So what I could do is I could store like the names of all of these in a string. And then if I wanted to like get just the player, what I would do is I would use indexing. So we can see the first letter of player, the P, is the fifth character. So we put in a four there, and then that'll output the P. All right, and this, uh, I'll go into one other thing. Uh, if we want to get multiple letters out of a string, then what we do is we use a colon. So in the case of orange, we put two colon four. So what this will do is it will take all of the letters from index two, all the way up to four, but it'll, it'll ignore the last letter. So in this case, the output will be a n. So in our example here, where we have car, player, background, if I wanted to get player, the first letter is four. And then if we count, L is five, A is six, Y is seven, uh, E is eight, R is nine. So what I can do is if I go four to nine, it'll actually miss by one. So if I hit enter here, we'll get play eight. And we wanna make sure we get that last character. So we need to go one extra. So we're gonna go from four up to 10. And then that'll give us play, which is what we want. All right, uh, does anyone, all right. Now let's say I wanted to get background from the same string. How would I do that? What, what numbers would I have to put in in these two spots? You're gonna need to count a little bit for this. So what what do we need to put in this first slot here? What 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 number needs to go there? We're we're looking for the index or the number that's associated with this B here, right? So does anyone, oh, go ahead, Sophia. 12. 12. Yeah, I think that should be correct. We can actually just try 12 to see. That gives us A. Oh, so then 11? 11, yeah, exactly. Yeah, counting these things is a little bit difficult sometimes. But yeah, 11, put that in, gives us B. All right, very good. So now if you want to get to the last letter, 
we need to figure out the index of it, right? And instead of counting, we can actually do something a little bit clever here. And we're going to use the length function that we described earlier. So I'm going to type len, you know, put in the whole string, close parenthesis. And that'll actually tell us the length of the whole thing is 21. So what's the index of the last character then if the length of the string is 21? 21. 21? Not quite, actually. It's close. You got to remember, so in the case of orange here, the first letter is 0, and the last letter is 5. And the length of orange is 6. So the index of the last letter is actually 1 less than the length. So in the case of our car player background thing, since the length is 21, the last letter should be one less than that. Just 20, exactly. Good job, Sophia. So now if we do car player background 20, we get D. All right, so if we wanted to get the full word background, we got to go from 11 to what? What's the second number we got to put in here? Let me check chat. 20. 20? Close. So actually, if I do 20, we get background. So we're missing the last letter here. We got to be really careful. So we got to remember that when we do this indexing thing, it never includes the very last number. So like when we go from two to four, we only get numbers two and three. We don't actually get four. So in this case, we want to do up to 21. Yeah, this is a little bit tricky, but once you get it, you'll remember it. So yeah, all the way up to 21, that gives us background. All right. Now, there's actually something a little bit more clever we can do here. If I actually go 11 and then colon with nothing else, I hit enter, it'll actually give us background. So what that means is if we don't put a number in there, then it'll just go all the way to the end. And the same is actually true if we do it the other way around. So if I put nothing and then colon and then three, this will actually give us car. So if we put nothing in the colon, it'll just go from the start or the end. All right. So yeah, indexing is a little bit difficult and it'll definitely be more useful when we go to arrays and things like that. But yeah, this is a hopefully a decent introduction to indexing. Cool. Does anyone have any questions? <clears throat> Onward. All right. So the last data type we're going to go over is numbers. So numbers are as you would probably expect them. But in Python, there's actually different kinds of numbers. So these are called ints, floats, and complex. We're going to ignore the complex ones uh, because I guess they're a little too complex for us. But we're just going to we're, we're going to talk about ints and floats. So does anyone know what an integer is? It's a common math term. Rodrigo, they must teach you this at Kumo. Not yet. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, so basically an integer is just any number that doesn't have a decimal place. So like three is an integer, 1,070 is an integer, 
Also negative numbers count. So minus 25 is an integer. Sometimes referred to as whole numbers, no? Right, I think there's a small distinction between integers and whole numbers. Oh. Maybe like whole numbers can't be negative. I think that's... Oh, right, 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 right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so integer is just like the broad term, any number without a decimal place. Zero is also an integer. Yeah, and then floats are just numbers that have decimals. So like 3.6 is a float. Uh, 0 0.5 is a float. 2.0, even though it's equal to two, it also counts as a float. So we gotta be really careful with things like that. Why do you need um, integers? Why not always use floating point numbers? Mm, good question. Uh, in Python, integers take up less storage space, I believe. And they're more efficient to use, generally. Mm. I think, Jane, you can correct me if I'm wrong there. Yeah, I, I think that's a very important point. And also, I think uh, maybe something could not be float. For example, maybe you want to count an uh, animal or something. Yeah, so maybe you don't have 1.5 ship. <laughs> yeah, so maybe that's why sometimes we should choose the correct form. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. Like, it wouldn't make sense to, you know, count 2.0 ships or it's just two I mean, we should make things as simple as possible so they like fit our application yeah all right so we can do some basic math with these things so if i just type 2 plus 2 alpha will be 4 we can do subtraction so like 5 minus 3 is 2 we can do multiplication uh, 8 times three. Also, one thing to note is you can use spaces in your math. I tend to like using spaces. I, I like the more spaced outlook, but it just depends on you know your personal preference. But it generally Python will ignore spaces in your math expressions. So you, you can do whatever you want there. But yeah, we can do multiplication. We can do division. Division's a little bit weird. So if I just do like nine divided by three, the output is a float. It doesn't give us a, it doesn't give us an integer here, even though the two inputs were integers. Yeah, and then I can do like 12 divided by five, it'll also be a float, 12 divided by four, float. So there's actually something we can do called integer division, which no matter what we put in, we'll always output an integer. So in this case, the way we do integer division is you do a division sign, and we do another one. We just do two of them. So 9 divided by 3, integer division, will just be 3. Now, we got to be careful with this, as always. If we do 12 integer division 5, well, if you remember earlier, it, it came out to be 2.4, which isn't quite an integer. So when we hit enter, what this does is this actually rounds down. So it just gets rid of the decimal completely. 2.4. 2.4 becomes two instead. Rounds down and rounds up or just rounds down? So if we do 14 divided by five, the output here is 2.8. And if we do 14 integer divides five, still two. So it always rounds down. Okay. Yeah. I think, yeah, that's not a function here. Yeah, this does something called the floor function. Uh, that's sort of more on the advanced side of math, but basically we're just rounding down always with integer division. Yeah, so let's see, we, we also, we need to be careful with just mixing integers and decimals. So if I did like two times 3.5, can anyone tell me what the answer to that's going to be if I multiply them? Seven. Yeah, exactly. It's seven. But when we do it in Python, we're taking an integer and we're multiplying it by a float. And whenever we do an integer mixed with a float, the output is always going to be a float. So in this case, when we do this, it's going to be seven, but as a float. 
which is 7.0. Yeah, so we got to be super careful with mixing integers and floats. If we accidentally put in a float, then our output is going to be a float. So if we want just integers, you got to make sure your inputs are all set to base. What if you do 10 divided by three uh, mm. in floating point numbers? Right. How many decimal points does it make? Yeah, so 10 divided by three is interesting because the output is a repeating decimal. Yeah. So when we do it here, it actually rounds it off and it rounds it off really weirdly. You see, so if in real life, the result would be 3.3 .3 repeating. So it would just be threes forever, which when we round it, it would just be like 3.3 3.3 and it wouldn't end in a five. So Python just does some really weird math sometimes. And these last digits, you're not going to be able to trust them. Huh. Yeah. So also definitely be careful when you're dividing numbers that don't necessarily like divide to terminating decimals. And if possible, or if it fits your application, integer division is usually the way to go. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, Jen, can you talk at all about how these functions, these number functions, apply in your ant game? Uh, sure, yeah. So yeah, so in, not only for ant game, also for image processing game. So that's a very, very basic skills for the games and uh, processing programming. And also one thing I want to add, uh, mm -hmm. can, 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 can Matthew input uh, uh, print zero double equal false? So can anyone guess what's the result for that? Mm. Yeah, that's very, or you can just uh, zero e double equal false. Right, right. Yeah, that's the, yeah, maybe that's what Matthew can add. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, Matthew, go, you can. Hit enter. Um, yeah. Yeah, so that will, yeah, so that's true. Yeah, so you can see that uh, for zero and the negative number in Python, so that stands for true. And for number above zero, that stands, uh, oh, sorry, that's for number above zero, that stands for true. For number zero or um, below zero, so that stands for false. Yeah, that's a very interesting in programming, yeah. Yeah, for sure. So I think Rodrigo mentioned earlier, but Booleans are pretty similar to binary, which means generally what Python will do is it will, it will equate true to one and false to zero. So this, this is a little bit strange, but if I actually did true plus true, the output is two, because we're just adding one plus one here. So yeah, there, there's kind of a, a parallel between these that is important to know. Great. Um, terrific, Matthew and Jane. Uh, before we adjourn, uh, do, do we want to help them load Python, install Python? Uh, yeah, sure. And do we have an exercise we could give them for next week? Or, yeah. Uh, so, I guess I have this cheat sheet at the very end of the presentation. Ah. So what you guys should do is, if you guys know how to screenshot, then take a screenshot of this and put it in your lab book. And this will help you remember these things for when you're coding on your own. Yeah, and then your exercise for next week will be to get Python. And we can help you out with that here. And then try some of these things out. Like, see what happens when you add, divide things, use this as like a calculator, play with strings, play with booleans, do like ands and nots and ors, and just go through all of these and test them. And like, make sure you understand what exactly is happening. And next week, if something happens that you don't expect or something really weird happens, then you can let us know. We can maybe try and explain it. Great, great. Okay, everyone know how to take a screenshot of this and add it to your lab book?
Kingsley, you know how to take a screenshot? It's it's uh, the print screen button. And then uh, uh, you can go into PowerPoint and simply do paste. And it'll take, uh, when you hit print screen, it puts it on the clipboard. All right, so Sophia had a question in the chat. Do you have to save every time you add something or it saves alone? So in this case, when we're typing in the console, this stuff typically doesn't get saved. So next week, we're going to talk about making documents in Python. And those you'll be able to save and like look at later. In this case, though, we're just typing things, hitting enter, and seeing what pops out. So this one doesn't really save. When I exit out and reopen it, it'll not be there the next time. OK, thanks. Yeah, no problem. Great. OK. And um, anyone have any questions about installation before we adjourn? You all know where to go to get Python. You probably just Google it. Google install Python for Mac or install Python for Windows. See if you can figure out how to install Python. And then secondly, be prepared next week to uh, explain the three different data types and some of the operators. How to open the Python. So uh, Donovan, do you actually want a screen share? We can walk you through it. Yeah, that's totally OK. We, we, we can walk you through it, even if you're not able to talk. All right, so it looks like, yeah, so this is Windows 10. Uh, all right, so on the bottom of your Google Chrome, it has Python 3.8.5.exe. So if you click on that. In the black area. Yes, yeah, all the way at the bottom on the left. So not, yeah, if you click open, then be able to install it. So if you just click on the top, uh, install now, and it'll go through the process. Should be pretty quick. All right, and if anyone's having trouble installing on Windows 10, follow along here because this will this will help for sure. All All right, there you go. So now if you close, that'll be fine. All right, so now if you go to the Windows icon in the bottom left, you scroll down to Python. Should be a folder. And then idle is what we use. And there you go. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> All right, Donovan, you're welcome. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Jang. All right, to be continued next week. Yep. Thanks for coming, everybody. Uh, ultimately, we're going to um, uh, put all this knowledge to a game. Yes. And yes. Uh, tonight, I don't know, uh, yeah. So let's meet next week and um, have a good week. Stay out of trouble. Thank you. You're welcome, Sylvia. Bye, Paulina. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Jane. Thanks, John. Thanks, Matthew. Thanks, uh, everyone. Thank you, Yang. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Um, Jang and Matthew, do you have a couple of minutes? Just like to. Um, so, Jeng, this is, I think, quite different than the way you introduced Python in China. What, 
what are the um, what what uh, what's your reaction to introducing Python this way, as opposed yeah. to showing yeah. them Python code and having them edit it? Yeah, I think uh, Matthew have very good uh, explanation about uh, the foundation of our programming. Yeah, so yeah. some of the concepts that I forget since uh, I did not uh, always using it. So yeah. So I think that's a very, maybe that's a very good way to develop the interest and also learn the knowledge, learn knowledge, yeah. Basic. I think, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe wow. Matthew, you can teach them the basic data type and maybe if for a while loop something. So maybe that's required for the game or image processing project. Right. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. So um, this has been a sort of long time uh, philosophical debate at Build It Yourself. Do you teach them from the bottom up by teaching them the primitives first, or do you give them a template and have them edit? So you're approaching this from the bottom up, Matthew, and mm -hmm. Zhang, you're approaching this from the top down, right? Yeah, yeah, that's totally different, yeah. Completely different way of learning. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you have a reaction to learning from the top down, editing versus learning? It's like HTML. You learn it. I learned HTML by just reading other people's code. Great. Right. I would hate to go to W3 and have to memorize all the HTML tags. That would be yeah, for sure. Yeah. Like I think probably the best approach combines the two. So like you're giving them some theory so they understand what's going on. Yeah. But also showing them like real life code and how it works yeah. definitely keeps them interested and yeah. like gives them direction. Right, right. I was a little disappointed that no one answered your questions. Um, oh. I mean, I was getting some answers in chat, which oh, was, yeah, was very yeah. I think uh, everyone, yeah. I think uh, Sophia and uh, Rodrigo they answer the question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, I think uh, uh, maybe Matthew and I will me will be very good partners since we have the totally different uh, way of learning. But uh, that right. will help them to better learning programming. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Definitely. Good. Yeah. Okay. Good. I'm really happy that you guys are working together. I think it's a very interesting combination. Yeah. Um, sure. Yeah. Yeah. I really like uh, the way Matthew teaches them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah patient. Yeah. And also, maybe uh, Matthew emphasizes we can learn from real world programming. So maybe my project will help them yeah. learn your basic knowledge. Yeah. Right. What if we, Matthew, should we uh, jump to Jeng's uh, Ant Game next week, Ant Game template, or should we spend one more week doing the bottom up before we go to the Ant Game? Uh, I'm, I'm actually, so I'm not sure what is required for the ant game, like what, oh. what concepts are in there that... Yeah, John, John, yeah, maybe, uh, do you think we need using the ant game or the image processing project? Whichever you think is most interesting, either one is fine. Oh, oh, sorry, what you mean? Either one is fine, Jane. Oh, I think maybe for the second one, that will be easier. Okay. Maybe for okay. the the game, so maybe John, maybe we have some more preparations. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'm sorry. So uh, we Matthew will drive the next class, and then after that, we'll introduce them to image processing. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Would sure. you recommend? Yeah, that's I recommend. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I I will send Matthew some of the non series that uh, you can you should cover next week yeah maybe okay. that's uh, important for the image processing project yeah. okay yeah so just let me know what i should be covering and then yeah. i'll yeah I'll but you it. are on the right track yeah so cool yeah. Good. good 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 okay guys see you next thursday all right okay. bye Thanks. see Thanks. you bye Matthew. bye bye, bye.